Senator Pat Galvan, thanks so much for joining us here on New York Now via Skype this week. Well, glad to be with you, Dan. So something that I'm really interested about and I wanted to pick your brain about because your district is, um, just for people that aren't really familiar with the counties of the state, it's kind of between Rochester and Buffalo, a very big rural district. If, and, and I should preface this by saying right now things upstate seem pretty stable. We don't seem to have an overwhelming of the hospital capacity, but if we see some sort of surge upstate, if we see a spike in cases, how prepared do you think is the rural healthcare network up there to handle something like that? Well, first let me talk about my, my district. So I span the greater Rochester and the greater Buffalo areas. Uh, I'm just a little bit south of Buffalo. So I cover Southern Erie County, all of Wyoming, Northern Livingston County, and uh, a portion of Southern Monroe County. The district is largely rural, but we do have a couple suburbs, uh, the suburb of Buffalo, suburb of Monroe, uh, suburb of Rochester as well. So you know, some of the northern part of the district actually um, is affected by things that happen close to an urban slash suburban environment. Uh, the large part, though, is indeed rural, as, as you've mentioned. So we have different concerns in different areas. What's interesting... You know, in Western New York, Buffalo and Erie County in particular, there seems to be a higher incident, incidence of coronavirus cases uh, higher than the rest of the state, um, excluding, of course, New York City, Long Island, uh, but, but higher than certainly Rochester, Syracuse, and Albany. So there's some particular concerns right in and around the city of Buffalo. The other areas, though, the more rural parts, it's somewhat rare. As of a few days ago, while I don't have the updated number, Livingston County, for instance, in a county with close to 60,000 people, they only had four or five reported cases at that particular time. So certainly things are different from region to region. Absolutely. But, but, having, but having said that, when we, we talk about rural hospitals in particular that serve the majority of the district that I represent and then neighboring districts, I think they are prepared to the extent that they can be. Fortunately, they have not seen the influx of cases that we've seen in New York City, um, in the surrounding areas of New York City, and in and around the city of Buffalo. Uh, but I do believe they're prepared. But what, what has happened in those areas, uh, they're struggling. They had, uh, it, it was always, it's always difficult for rural or community hospitals to make ends meet. And for the hospitals that were making ends meet, they relied on the elective surgeries, the clinics, the people coming in and out of the hospital. And with the, that revenue stream being taken away from them, they have very serious cash flow issues. So two different things. If they were to have an influx of coronavirus cases, uh, it'd be very difficult to sustain the service without some sort of federal or state assistance from a cash flow perspective. That's really on interesting. Other, Sorry, go yeah, ahead. If Sorry. On, the, on the other hand, if they're not getting the cases, uh, then they should be allowed to be doing these elective surgeries because if they're not, they're also going to run out of cash and not be able to serve the community. Uh, today, though, uh, in Buffalo, the governor did announce that uh, beginning next week, they were going to start phasing in uh, hospitals being permitted in certain cases to do elective surgeries. And I think that's something that can be helpful to the rural hospital network in the state. Yeah, I could not imagine leading one of these hospitals outside of New York City where, you know, you don't have this overwhelming number of coronavirus cases, but you're being told that you can't use your facility to do something that really generates money for you. And as you mentioned, in some of these smaller, not, I shouldn't say smaller counties, I should say less dense counties, because some of these counties upstate are huge, as you know, compared to counties like Albany County and Nassau, Suffolk. In some of these less dense counties, we see less cases. And I just remember at the start of this, we saw less cases because we had less testing. Do you think that in those counties, it's, it's, uh, it's that there is less testing available to people? Or do you think that it's just a situation where there's less density, so there's less people interacting, so there's less spread of the disease? I think both. And, and I say that uh, you know, in a partially uneducated way, of course. We don't know who has what. I am not, uh, I am not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. 
I don't know the specific numbers. We're only speculating that because of the lack of sufficient number of tests up to this point, it, it, it's common wisdom or it's accepted wisdom that we don't know how much the coronavirus is out there and how many people have been affected by it or carry it. So the testing, of course, is critical. Uh, we know that the governor is supposed to be meeting with the president today to talk specifically about testing. And testing is among the things that are very critical to help reopening the state. So I think the lack of testing, uh, to answer your question, is one of the things that contributes to these numbers. But the second thing is also uh, the fact that all of upstate is not as dense uh, as New York City is when it comes to the population and the proximity to each other. And we know from science that social distancing is something that's helping, uh, helping to work to help prevent or slow the spread of this disease. And in much of upstate, especially rural upstate New York, we have, uh, we have that natural open space. Uh, we don't have people living in high-rise apartments. We don't have people working in cubicles right next to each other. Uh, they are spaced out. And, and so I think that is also key to reopening the economy, where when we're looking to reopen the economy across the state, we should be looking at regions and treat regions and areas differently. Um, I mentioned a Livingston County with a few number of cases. Um, no doubt there are some cases there that we don't know about because of lack of testing. But by the same token, it is a more rural county. People are more spaced out. And I think businesses can be reopened in a safe and responsible way. And that's really what we, we have to do. We have to look at the combination of those things um, and recognize that we can't be have a one-size-fits-all approach as we're trying to reopen the world to us, reopen our economy, reopen our communities. Yeah, you're making me think of where I'm from um, originally in Shenango County, right beside Delaware County, where if you ask somebody to socially distance, as far as being six feet away from somebody, you say, well, I'm already doing that every day, so I guess it doesn't change <laughs> exactly. life too much for me. Um, I, well, if you go back from where you're from, that's um, you, you can you can picture the district I represent. It's largely like that, and so you you see that there is some of that natural spacing that's out there, and and certainly I think the people in many of the rural areas they can they don't have the challenges that you face in New York City when you walk across the street. There's hundreds of people moving with you when you go to your home, your home is typically in an apartment or a high rise, and you're going in an elevator in a stairway or through a door with other people. That's not the case in the, in the good majority of the geographic population of the state. And we should recognize that. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the economy a little bit, because we saw earlier this week, Governor Cuomo is saying that he wants to take a regional approach to reopening the economy, which is something that lawmakers um, have, Republicans mostly have called for for the past couple of weeks now. As you said, looking at different counties around the state, you just don't have that amount of coronavirus cases and the need there to really separate people as much as that. Are you optimistic about the state's plan to reopen regionally? Is that, does that satisfy you for what you want out of, you know, kind of getting things back in order? The question I'd ask is what plan, and I'll come to that in just a moment. Right. Um, but I, I'm very pleased that the governor is talking about reopening the state, so to speak, on a regional basis. That makes all the sense in the world. It makes just as much sense as the governor of New York State's involvement with other states where we're doing something regionally as it relates to the entire United States and the Northeast. We should be doing the same thing within our own state. So now is the time, though, for action. Instead of just talking that we're going to reopen this regionally, and I'm, but as I mentioned, I'm very happy that the governor has said that, now is the time to put an actual plan forward. So what does that look like, I guess? What, um, what questions do you think the state should be asking when it's looking to reopen the economy in kind of these rural areas where we don't see a lot of cases? What's been on my mind, and it may have been on your mind as well, is you know, maybe we haven't seen the cases in these rural areas because we haven't reopened yet. And in the back of my mind, I just have this fear of like, these rural hospitals might be overwhelmed if we reopen too soon. What does that balance look like for you going forward? 
Well, I think if we if we go too far too soon, that's a problem. First and foremost, public safety has to be in everybody's mind, and that must come first. How do we reopen safely? So we look at certain areas where the incidents incident of coronavirus cases are low. We do some of the testing that's in place. Uh, we we kind of have an idea of what we're facing. And when we start some of these businesses back, we continue to practice the precautions, the, the social distancing, the wearing of personal protective equipment where it's appropriate to do so, spacing. Uh, I'm certainly not calling for a restaurant uh, to open exactly the way that it was before, just because it's in a rural area, for instance, if you've got a restaurant where you have a hundred, you know, you've got 15 to 20 tables that can seat a hundred people in a very small space, we shouldn't immediately go back to that. But at a certain point in time, when it's appropriate to open restaurants back, we can say, okay, well, maybe you can't open your capacity of a hundred people. So let's start at 25% capacity. That's only an example. That's not a real number. Uh, but you, you look at businesses, we should be able to open swimming pools. We now know that we can do certain things out on golf courses. The things that we can do safely, uh, people can do landscaping, not just maintenance. There's no reason why a landscaping business can't go out and start planting new trees or new gardens for people, so long as they practice some of those uh, you know, some of some of the safety, the, the precaution things, the, the precautionary things that we're taking now. So I think it's a combination. I think you have to look at what businesses can we reopen in a safe manner. And that's the key, safety first. Right. I really fear for these small businesses everywhere in the state. I mean, New York City, but upstate, especially when you already had so much burden on these businesses and now to tell them you have to be closed for two months, no option of revenue, it's got to be frustrating. And, um, you know, speaking of revenue, I want to get your thoughts on the budget before I let you go. One part of the budget, is, and I think everybody was kind of surprised about it, is going to let the governor cut spending throughout the year if the state doesn't have enough revenue. I'm wondering how you feel about that. If you have an opinion on it, um, he and just for our viewers, he could cut uh, spending to schools, local governments, hospitals, a lot of things. Uh, how do you see that? I think the legislature abdicated the the majority who voted for this. They abdicated their legislative responsibility and gave legislative authority to the governor. Um, and I think that's very problematic to put. Uh, so much power in one individual's hands. Now, I want to distinguish uh, the budget authority that was given as far as the, the governor being able to unilaterally move money around or stop spending. That's different than the governor uh, being the executive during an emergency. Oh, right. Absolutely. When you have, when you have an emergency, um, like we're seeing, uh, whether it's the president or the other 50 governors, or we see county executives, or we see mayors. The law provides significant power to an executive in an emergency. Somebody needs to be in charge. We're not going to agree with all the decisions that the executive, whether it's the governor or county executive, president makes, but we still need to have somebody in charge during an emergency. So those laws are appropriate and relevant. When it comes to the budget, however, the, the giving away of that legislative authority to the governor, I think really amounted to the the, the majorities uh, abdicating their responsibility and what they were elected to do. And now that the governor, the executive has that responsibility, it'll be very difficult for the legislature to get that back. And and I think our system, um, I, I think we've, we've, the legislature has moved away from a system that was designed by our forefathers, a system of check and balance, checks and balances. This clearly tilts the budgetary process, uh, not just during the budget making process, but now uh, the fulfilling of that budget and, and it, it, for, the, six, for the, the 12 months after a budget is adopted, now the governor has, an, a, un, the playing field is no longer level and it clearly tilts in the governor's favor and that's not good for citizens. And just before I let you go, 
you're a former member of law enforcement and just very frankly speaking, you are one of the smartest guys in terms of criminal law that I know because you are a former member of law enforcement. There were also these changes to cash bail in the budget. Um, it, basically what they did is add more offenses to the list of charges that would be eligible for cash bail and kind of rolled back what we saw a little bit. And I know that your conference was advocating for more. How did you see this? Was this a step in the right direction in your opinion from where you're coming from? Would you like to see more or was this a good compromise? I think I think public safety is the key. Uh, there's just no question about it. It's, uh, you know, we're dealing with this coronavirus and it's affected society in so many different ways. We saw as a result of the criminal justice changes that that the majority had implemented uh, that were effective January 1st, we saw crime going up and problems across communities in the state and cries from all types of elected officials and citizens, Democrats and Republicans alike, that they wanted change. So we've now seen some change that, again, was done just like it was a year ago behind closed doors without public dis discussion. Uh, and we really don't know how it's going to affect the community. I, I don't think that it went far enough uh, by any means. And here's why. Judges still have no discretion as it relates to public safety. And I think that that's problematic. If we look to our neighbors, New Jersey, one of the things that they did when they eliminated cash bail is, is that they, they actually implemented a risk assessment tool that's supposed to be a non-biased, objective look at an individual as to whether they posed a risk to society or a risk for flight. And then the judges were able to use that scientific tool to help make a decision as it relates, again, to those two things, to public safety and whether they're the individuals are risk of flight or not. And I think that's something that we need to move to in New York. So long as judges do not have discretion to do their jobs properly, I still think that any changes are lacking. And, and I, I also think uh, the fact that this was done, again, just like a year ago, in the 11th hour, the so-called dark of night, and I don't recall if this was passed in day or night, but what I do know is it was not publicly discussed. There was no three-day waiting period. We, the majority still did not conduct hearings at all on this and publicly hear input from prosecutors, from law enforcement, from defense attorneys, from domestic violence groups, from victim advocate groups, from people in the community who were concerned about the changes in the first place. So I think much more discussion uh, needs to be had about the, the criminal justice changes. All right. Well, we will check back in with you. Senator Pat Galvan from uh, Western New York, thank you so much for being here on New York Now this week. Always great to talk to you. Thanks for your time, Dan.